Well, Laura, we wouldn't expect anything else from you <laughs> except to outdo yourself. <laughs> it's just funny the things you think about, you know. And just hey, letting everybody know we are now live on YouTube. Perfect. Thank you. I was just going to ask you if we were going on there. Okay, about we have about another minute before meeting time. Hopefully, Mrs. Case will be able to pop in by then. Hey, Anne, I think we forgot roll call last time. Did we? No, we did it. We didn't. It was just wait. Never mind. I flipped it. I flipped the pledge and roll call. Okay. Yeah. And All then right. we I, something was different. Yeah. I was looking because right remember Sue. Sue answered I and then replaced it with here. That was that meeting. Oh yeah yeah yeah. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. Keep them I all mean, straight. Me. <laughs> Okay, well, we are at 630. Um, so I'm going to call this meeting to order. And uh, this is a governing board study session. It is Thursday, August 27, 630. Um, this is our second of two meetings that we are holding to discuss attendance boundary changes for elementary number 33, Wildfire Fireside and Boulder Creek Elementary Schools and explore in mountain trail middle schools and um, detailed uh, more detailed information can be found on our district website and um, although there will not be a physical location for for members of the public to attend you may join via webex if you're here or via youtube and that information is also posted on the website so with that, um, Mrs. Bacon, will you please lead us if Dr. Welsh can get our flag up and then Mrs. Bacon, will you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all.
Thank you very much. And Ms. Jasmine, may I have roll call, please? Dr. Skidmore? Here. Mrs. Matura? Here. Mrs. Greenberg? Here. Mrs. Case? Mrs. Bacon? Here. Thank you very much. Hopefully Mrs. Case will be jumping on soon. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Welsh. All right, thank you, President Greenberg. Um, very similar to our meeting on Tuesday night. Um, we're following the same format with a couple of little additions just based on some feedback we've gotten from the community. Um, so again, the thinking was, of course, to provide members of our community multiple opportunities to participate. That way, if uh, they couldn't make it one night, they could, of course, make the other. And so um, we'll begin as we did uh, last time with um, a presentation um, by Ms. Felton, as well as with Rick Brammer, our um, demographer who works for uh, the district, um, who will share some of uh, the demographic information. And we'll go over the um, boundary recommendations and maps. Um, we'll follow up with any um, discussion or questions from the board. And then we'll run uh, through some of the feedback that we received from members of the community, both in total from uh, the two meetings, as well as um, subsequent, we had a number of comments come in between uh, the meeting Tuesday and the meeting Thursday, and then any closing remarks from uh, the governing board uh, as well. So I think with that, um, Ms. Felton, if you want to um, pull up the presentation, I will turn it over to um, you and Mr. Brammer so that we can uh, share the update. Actually, while you're doing that, I believe Mrs. Case has joined us. I just want to. Oh, perfect. That for the record. Yeah. Thanks. Yes, I'm on. Thanks, Nancy. Go ahead, Ms. Felton. Oh. I'm trying to. <laughs> no worries. Take your time. All right. How are we doing there? You can't hear me, can you? No, we can hear you. That looks great. Sorry. We were all giving you the thumbs up. If you want to add anything, so um, thank you um, for that help getting started and good evening, Mrs. Greenberg, governing board members, Dr. Welsh cabinet and the entire PV schools community who's joining us this evening. This, meeting, this evening's meeting is in compliance with Arizona Revised Statutes 15-341, subsection 37, and it's a pleasure for me to present the recommendations from the Boundary Committee. So I want to talk about where we're going in this presentation itself. Um, this presentation will cover the process that PV Schools uses for developing boundary change recommendations review some of the data utilized by the Boundary Committee itself, and then present the actual recommendations and related maps of this committee. So for those of you who are familiar with the collaborative process used by the district, this boundary setting process won't be surprising to you. Additionally, this process meets the requirements of the state and the as well as governing board policy. It begins with the superintendent calling for a committee and setting a purpose for the committee. It be, um, this, in this instance, the need was first driven by the building of a new elementary school, which we affectionately at this point call elementary school number three or ES 33. We're hoping it'll have a new name soon. Um, and uh, we'll talk more about the committee and its purpose in just a moment. Stakeholder groups provided names of participants for the committee of those who might be impacted by the issue. We'll be reviewing this committee's makeup in a moment. The committee meets, reviews, and requests data before developing a recommendation, uh, which is officially presented to the governing board. If the governing board wishes to continue with the process, public meetings are held to pre present the recommendation and to receive the feedback. And that's what we did on Tuesday night and what we're doing this evening. Ultimately, the governing board must adopt any school boundary. Okay, so let's talk about the process this particular committee went through. We met four times um, from January through February. We got it all in before the universe changed in March. Um, they did a really great job of reviewing enrollments, the demographic data, as well as um, the community maps 
um, affecting the schools north of 101. They developed guiding principles for boundary setting and then developed recommendations to address the attendance boundaries north of 101. And obviously we were specifically looking at elementary school number 33. Uh, the charge that this group was given by the superintendent was to review all the K-12 school boundaries north of the 101, including um, the demographic projections and the effects on opening ES-33. So um, these are the committee members we have. I do wanna thank them all for participating in the process. If it was a live meeting, we'd ask these folks to stand up so we could thank them. So if you're here, go ahead, stand up in your living room or wherever you're right now. Uh, we, do, we do take uh, your time and your input as valued um, by the governing board and the cabinet as a whole. This group in particular really took their charge ser seriously. Uh, they asked for data in lots of different forms. They challenged each other with great questions and different ideas. Um, so as you can see here, we represent different groups. So the first group is of course the parents. It's the United Parent Council, we call it the UPC. We had community members from Honor Health, Oasis Church and Paradise Valley Community College. We had Central Office Administrators or COA from the Transportation and Community Ed Offices. We had principal representation from the PVP from the schools impacted or possibly impacted. We had teachers represented, represented by the Paradise Valley Education Association or PVEA, as well as um, participants from the PVSEA, which is the Paradise Valley Support Employees Association. In general, Wildfire, Fireside, Boulder Creek, and Greyhawk Elementary Schools were included in representation on this committee, as well as at least one parent from the Sky Crossing community. Mountain Trail and Explorer Middle School were both represented as well as both North Canyon and Pinnacle High School. We typically have an equal balance between all the stakeholder groups, but based on the subject matter, there were more parents and less administrators on this committee. So here are the guiding principles that the, um, that the committee came up with to help them reach their decision. Um, all of these principles were considered and an effort was made to balance them, but frequently they couldn't be equally balanced. So first of all, the number one thing this committee wanted to do was keep neighborhoods together. So there was a focus on the neighborhood. We also considered transporting students um, and how we would do that and would it would be, be looking at grandfathering in any of those instances based on things like limited resources, which includes both not just buses, but also drivers. Um, that's always a challenge trying to get drivers. Uh, the distance of the transportation, the student would, would have to go through the length of time they were on the bus. We also looked at safe routes to schools. Um, we tried to be forward thinking about the future so we could in, uh, minimize the impact to families. That was a very hard charge because it really is dependent upon the growth and the real estate market up in the area. And it, it's very hard to predict, the, predict those things. Um, we did want to look at balancing enrollment across our schools. As a district, we always try to be um, fiscally responsible. And so we do look at whether options are economically viable. We did consider feeder systems. That's sometimes a hard one. We don't have a system in Paradise Valley where um, one, one elementary school feeds into one middle school that feeds into a high school. That's just a, not a concept that we have. It doesn't work very well. Um, and the communities we have. And we do also consider enrollment trends um, and their impact on enrollment. So now I'm gonna turn us over to Mr. Rick Brammer from Applied Economics, who's gonna talk to us a little bit about his work. Thank you, Ms. Felton. Um, yes, Applied Economics by, just for information, has had the privilege of serving the district actually since 2005 and have been through four of these sort of uh, boundary planning and adjustment processes. So, um, and we've survived each and every one of them. So uh, we're happy to be here again tonight. And wanted to just start off by setting the table with the geography of the area so everybody understands exactly which parts of the district uh, that, were, that we were charged to, to look at in this case. And so you see the Northern portion of the district here, which extends from you know, the 16th Avenue alignment on the west 
to the Pima Road on the east, from Joe Max on the north. And in this case, we're cutting it off at the 101 freeway. That was the charge of this committee. And inside of that particular area, there are six elementary schools. The elementary schools have, are designated with their names, Boulder Creek, Wildfire, Fireside. Those are their attendance areas, but those are outlined in purple lines. And then the colors of the underlying squares, which are the actual planning grids that we use for all of our work. We know how many students have come out of each one of the 469 planning grids in the district every year for the last 15 years. So we have an incredible you know, base of information. As I said, in this case, those planning grids are colored um, by the middle school attendance areas. And so you, first time you see, we have the, uh, the two then middle schools, the green um, mountain trail area and, and the blue explorer area and the way, you know, those are structured currently where the mountain trail area really wraps around all the way to the eastern portion of, the, of, of, of the district. Next slide. Thank you, so sorry. I apologize. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Okay. Our custodians were in here working, making some noise, so I apologize. <laughs> So one of the things, you know, we, we obviously need to look at when we're doing attendance pl uh, planning, it's not only where kids are now, but where they're going to be in the future. And in this case, how the distribution of those committees, uh, uh, those, of communities, I'm sorry, sort of influences where these lines can be drawn. So as we look at the area in North Phoenix, you look in the center of the map first, and that's your desert ridge area. And that area has been underdeveloped for, you know, 20 plus years. Um, it's kind of ground to a halt at this point, but there's a portion in the eastern part of it, east of 56th Street, that's just now beginning to uh, restart, and we're looking for some new growth there um, in the coming years. But right now, the name of the game is Sky Crossing, which is, of course, where elementary school number 33 is located. And as we can see, um, for better or for worse, it is split exactly down the middle. Uh, in terms of attendance area with Boulder Creek, the west half, and uh, wildfire on the east half. So um, obviously some adjustments are necessary there. Coming in the near future up to the northwest of that, north of the Boulder Creek Elementary uh, School, is a new project called Stone Butte. And it's new enough that it's actually, we're, we're taking it into account and making sure it still works with everything, but those, that area is so new, it hasn't actually been included in the projections that you're gonna see yet. Um, and then the big, the big game for the future is a project, it's a state land holding called Azera. And it's two miles uh, north to south and six miles east to west. Um, most of it's raw desert. Uh, there are huge infrastructure challenges going forward. Uh, but the city is making plans to begin uh, providing that for development, starting with the area immediately along Cave Creek Road, um, north of Sky Cross in there where you can see. So there is definitely future growth coming uh, into the area that we're working with. And so in the next slide, we kind of zoom in further to the area that we're really tasked with looking at, at least for the, uh, for the elementary schools. And you see these, um, these areas reemerge, and we're calling them identified communities. And one of the things that made this process so much different than a typical boundary study is that students in this area aren't evenly distributed. They're clustered into these particular communities. And the little green dots, I don't know how visible they are to everyone, you can see on this map are the actual locations of uh, students enrolled in, in a Paradise Valley school. So obviously, we see the larger concentrations around the existing elementary schools, mountain trail and wildfire, desert trails, the you know, green dots everywhere. And those areas are within what we think of as the walk zones for those schools. And so we really don't you know, like to move students in those areas. So as we begin looking at options, we kind of set those areas aside and kind of 
you know, hold those as they are. And then we started looking at what was left. And the interesting thing is the Sky Crossing development, of course, its own community, that's going to be its walk zone. And so it really only left us with a couple of pieces that we could manipulate in order to balance uh, the enrollment between the schools. And so we were basically looking at the Desert Peak community, um, which while it looks like it's attached to the to the rest of the Boulder Creek community, and I'm, I'm sure in some ways it is, there's actually a clear uh, boundary between the two developments right there. Uh, the, there is only one street that goes through in between them, and it's quite a ways north and small. And then, of course, we have the Tatum Highlands community, which is up along uh, Tatum Boulevard on the northern edge of the district uh, as our other concentration with, you know, a significant number of students. There are a few st um, students coming from the Desert Shade area. There's an apartment complex there and the same over it in the Ridgewood area, number two. But you can see that we somewhat had, were limited on what we could look at by the shape of the building blocks. The village of, of Aviano, part of the wildfire area, it's close enough, but still, um, you know, it was considered um, in terms of whether that might be one of the things that we look at. So that was kind of the lay of land that we had to work with. Um, and we'll look at what that means in terms of some of the numbers next. OK, so during our prior study session with the governing board, a request for more data emerged as the question as to whether ES33 would be a kindergarten through sixth grade school or kindergarten through eighth grade. So Mr. Bammer probed some more data that we might thought, we thought we might want to consider as we're looking at the school boundary recommendations this evening. So uh, Rick, you want to walk us through the data we have here? Yes, based in, with the projections that we had available uh, during our work in February, at least, we were looking at the, the combined attendance area of having Mountain Trail and what would be elementary school 33 um, as a as a seven eight school, they would be about six hundred students there uh, in ten years by twenty nine thirty. Uh, the vast majority, obviously, would still be in the Mount Trail area, leaving you know less than two hundred students in seventh and eighth grade uh, at elementary school number thirty three. Thank you, Rick. Um, so here are the current elementary school boundaries for the schools impacted by the recommendation. Um, being made this evening. Uh, the di dividing line between Boulder Creek and Wildfire is this infamous 32nd Street alignment that we keep talking about. Um, that boundary was set between Boulder Creek and Wildfire years ago before the Sky Crossing community um, was designed. If everybody remembers back in the day, we used to have pretty nice little straight north south road boundaries. Um, and that's just not the way we develop neighborhoods anymore. Um, so um, as you see here in kind of this light green, if you can see that is the uh, sky crossing community with that 32nd, three, 32nd Street alignment through it, we obviously um, had a problem with one of our guiding principles um, that the committee was looking to, which was keeping neighborhoods together. So this, this did present a problem is one of the things that we considered along with the data. Um, so making the final uh, recommendations for elementary school number 33, you see that same sky crossing community here in the middle. And um, we have it between the wildfire um, on the north end, fireside on the south end, and um, then Boulder Creek on the west side of the elementary school 33 um, boundary. So let's look a little bit at some words. If you're more of a word person, um, so the committee really did follow their principles, keeping communities together. They consider transportation, look toward future growth and an effort to minimize future changes, as well as trying to balance um, school enrollment. And so um, the recommendation is to create an elementary school boundary on uh, number 33 running along that Black Mountain Boulevard. That is a major artery that's only going to get bigger. Um, on the east side of ES 33 with the west end boundary um, kind of looping around to encompass that desert peak community that Mr. Bram Brammer talked about. Um, and then it runs along Pinnacle Peak Road, um, but then it turns south at the point where it captures all of the students of the Sky Crossing community as well as the Ridgeview community. 
And then it does run north all the way to the very top northern end of the district. So that's kind of a description of this boundary. So I'm going to put the picture back up here again um, and walk you through it. So um, coming off um, the freeway interchange here, I'm running north on the Black Mountain Boulevard. Um, part of this is an alignment up 48th Street and will be developed as that area does develop out, but it, it does run on the west side. Oh, I'm sorry, 40th Street. Um, thank you, Rick. On the west side of the community up here across the district and then um, down the 24th Street alignment to capture that community there at Desert Peak. And then this alignment down here on the south end of the ES33 boundaries does capture um, all of the homes with the ES33, or I'm sorry, the Sky, Cross, the Sky Crossing community. Okay, um, I'm gonna turn us back over to Mr. Brammer to talk about some of the numbers when we looked at the demographic projections for this recommendation. Yes, thank you. Um, basically, we're looking at two different scenarios here with the current attendance areas and the recommended attendance areas. However, um, it, we're not just strictly looking at the attendance areas, and it's important to understand that these numbers also include the impacts of open enrollment, because in this area, there's a lot of movement of, of uh, students between schools and in and out of the district. And so we have to account for that in, in doing these in doing these, even though uh, we're basing um, primary attendance on these uh, attendance area boundaries. So uh, with the current boundaries in place, you can see Boulder Creek gets awfully large. Um, and this does not include the Stone Butte community. So it would actually get um, even larger than that. With the recommended attendance area boundaries, we get a reasonable balance between all of the schools. Um, I like the fact that Boulder Creek and Wildfire um, remain a little low uh, because there's a lot of future growth coming in that area, which means that these boundaries can last for much longer. And we don't know exactly when that's going to happen because the way the state lands department auctions land isn't, you know, totally a market driven process, but we know there's plenty of land up there and we know there's plenty of land development. So we think this is going to provide a, a good solid solution for at least 10 years, uh, if not longer going forward. And we're going to hold Mr. Brammer to that, right, guys? <laughs> anyway. <laughs> I'm going to retire before then. <laughs> all right. All right. I don't want to run you off sooner than you want to. So we won't talk about that anymore. <laughs> so that does wrap up the elementary school boundary recommendations. And next, we're going to move on to talking about middle school boundaries. And so um, as Mr. Brammer showed us, earlier a map, um, I believe it was based off of um, the neighborhoods and communities. Um, this map is, is a little bit cleaner, so you can see that oddly shaped horseshoe um, that runs, runs through here. Um, I had just started with the district when this horseshoe was developed, and I thought that was one of the most interesting attendance boundaries I had seen. And then it was really explained to me that this boundary is a result of a curricular decision um, that these schools here in the horseshoe shape actually use core knowledge curriculum, while the um, attendance boundaries here in the middle, more the islands of Explorer here, both at the northern end and in the Desert Ridge community itself, were actually not core knowledge based schools. And so, and if you remember at the time, transportation was not quite the issue it is up in this uh, area now. Um, and so um, we do have these students here on the east side who, if they attend their Mountain Trail Middle School assigned attendance area, actually drive past um, Explore Middle School very closely as they get to their Mountain Trail School. And because of that, many of these students over here on the uh, east side of the district or on the attendance area for Mountain Trail do open and enroll to Explore. So that's kind of um, our little outline that we have today. Um, and so when the committee um, was looking at our um, guiding principles, as well as the data, what came out was a recommendation to set the boundary, um, not dividing any of the communities and to set the boundary at the Black Mountain Parkway, as well as the extension up here on uh, the northern end. So it would divide those two middle schools without a horseshoe into an east-west boundary 
with Pinnacle Peak and Greyhawk um, being boundary to explore middle school. So let's talk about some of the things we considered when we looked at that. Um, so the current boundary, as we talked about, was created for curricular reasons that no longer is, exist. Those, those schools um, do not feed into a middle school that continues a strong basis of core knowledge. Um, and so we did look at eliminating the horseshoe um, uh, because it, it meets many of our criteria of keeping uh, communities together, minimizing transportation, um, as well as the fact that many of those students are already opening rolling there. A map, Black Mountain Boulevard itself is just a natural divider um, within the community. And so that's why that was um, chosen. We were aware that there were a con that um, Sky Crossing community buyers were told that Explore was their middle school, even though um, it was just a temporary open enrollment adjustment. All right, now back to Mr. Brammer to talk the numbers. Tell us the story here. Thank you. Um, we have an interesting phenomenon you know, going on district wide as you look at these numbers. And again, Stone Butte not included um, in that we've had a drop in elementary enrollment over the last several years driven by lower birth rates and, and things like that. Um, and that dip is going to hit at the uh, middle school and then the high school levels over the next few years. So the fact that there's not a lot of growth showing in these numbers is somewhat a function of, of what's going on uh, demographically. And it's going to bounce back again, uh, particularly with the growth that's going to come to that area, um, certainly beyond this period. But as we looked at these numbers and really got to look at where students were living and where they really were attending, um, that there was really only about 60 students uh, that were that were making the the trip, if you will, from the two elementary schools east of Scottsdale Road over to um, Mountain Trail. And because the rest of that area is basically undeveloped, um, it really only makes about a 60 student difference now, probably only about a 40 student difference 10 years from now. Um, where you draw this line, because effectively with open enrollment, uh, most of the population has already, you know, redrawn their own map. So um, the, these numbers don't really uh, make um, anything better or worse uh, that I can see um, just different and more clear and obviously uh, bring with them some fair um, economies in terms of transportation and, and so forth. Thank you very much. Um, so just as a reminder, um, while the focus has been on the elementary and middle school boundaries, um, the committee did look at high schools because um, we were charged to look with all the schools north of the 101. And really given the current demographic projections, there just was no need for any kind of boundary change recommendation in the high school um, arena. In fact, we really felt that uh, this school would hold out until there really was some substantial growth in those areas. Dr. Or Dr. Brammer, see, I keep keep moving you up the, the ladder there, don't I? Um, so until we see that at substantial growth, which really at that point in time, we're not going to look at shifting the populations because most of our northern schools are larger um, high schools. We would really be looking at building a new high school. Um, which is slated for the state land department area um, when that gets released at some point in the future. Um, so with that, that concludes our formal presentation and I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Welsh uh, for him to kind of lead this portion of the meeting. Thanks, Ms. Selton, and uh, thank you again, Rick, for uh, the walk through the numbers with us tonight. Uh, again, if there's any uh, initial discussion questions among board members, we can talk about that now, and then uh, following that, we can run through uh, some of the feedback we've gotten from our community, both overall and since our last meeting. Um, from what I can see, Dr. Skidmore, I think you've got your mic off. Do you have a question? Oh, All right, I'm sorry, that's what I meant. Um, I just want to, to ask Mr. Brammer and Mrs. Felton one question. 
it seems to me that based on these recommendations, approximately, all right, I'm not, I, I'm not going to get down to the nitty gritty math that Dr. Welsh can do, explore elementary or middle school will be twice the size of Mountain Trail. Is that correct? If the current attendance patterns hold, yes. Mrs. Bacon, can I add to that question? Um, so if current attendance patterns hold, what if there is more development to the north? Are we including whatever's scheduled to be built to the north? We're including what is scheduled to be built in the in the north, um, it, certainly in the western portion of the district. I'm not aware of any plans in the northeastern area at all at this point. We are including everything that we know about, with the exception of the fact that I, you know, like I said before, the Stone Butte um, community plan came along after these projections were developed. And in fact, we've looked at what impact that might make and it could easily add another 250 or so um, students over the next 10 years but the fact of the matter is is that because this all this land pretty much everything that's left is in the hands of the state lands department and their job their their charge is to maximize their return on public land and so they hold out for the highest dollar and that's okay it just makes it take a really long time for things to build and so, you know, if, if, if it was market driven, everything between Desert, be, between Desert Ridge and, and Tatum Ranch would already be built. It, it, it's, it's not, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. way. And so we see all this development and we think there should be more growth and um, it's been, it's been fairly paced. Okay, so I, I have a number of questions, um, but before I ask all those questions, the one thing I want to thank whoever in the community um, talk to us about the inappropriateness of using the word grandfathering. I want to thank you. I apologize for using that. I think I'm the first one who introduced it. And um, I appreciate that feedback and I think we all do. So from now on, it will be called an open enrollment variance. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there. Um, and I, I appreciate that. Usually it's my kids who are telling me what I'm doing wrong, but I, I really appreciate that. Um, and we'll strive, of course, to do better all the time. A um, couple of other questions I have. Um, when, when, let's just assume, let's just say we're going to have Hawk, Pinnacle Peak Elementary, and Sky Crossing be zoned for Explorer. What would those numbers look like? in the next three to five years. I have, a I have a clarification question, Julie, for you, I'm sorry. When you say sky crossing, do you mean elementary school 33 by boundaries or just sky crossing community itself boundaries? The, the 33 boundaries, let's just assume that we took elementary 33, we boundaried it to explore and we had Pinnacle Peak and Greyhawk going to explore. It would add roughly two, it would add roughly two hundred students. And to it, is, explore. And is that above our enrollment? Over over and above that current number you're seeing, so it would make explore nearly twelve hundred students, which we we have no capacity for. I, I don't. I, I can't speak to the capacity. Well, Dr. Welsh. Yeah, I, I can certainly speak to that. I, I believe uh, at our best estimates, the capacity of that campus is pretty pretty close to where we are in the 900s, maybe a thousand tops. Okay, so that makes this even more complicated because it doesn't necessarily really make sense to have Greyhawk and Pinnacle Peak go to Mountain Trail anymore. So, uh, so that complicates things more. That I guess that's all I have to say at the moment. <laughs> it seems to make it even more difficult a decision. It would complicate it even more if those kids were actually going to Mountain Trail. 
That means uh, we're only looking at a 60 person difference instead of another 200. Uh, so, um, you know, it could actually be worse. Right. But we don't have capacity to do that at Explorer. That's, that's one of the issues in making everyone happy that is a challenge right now. Thank you. Does Dr. Uh, Stable? I, I, I would just like to add one thing. This is based on qualify your statement. We currently do not have the capacity to, to take in 1,200 kids. That doesn't mean that we couldn't change the capacity of Explorer. That's true, but to what end? Then Mountain Trail has, you know, again, it's all about that balancing. I mean, we have to think about those things. And I don't know what that campus has in terms of land and the ability for it to be added on to. I suppose it always could be built up. I don't, but I don't know if there are, are limitations in terms of building height in those communities and, you know. Well, due respect, Mrs. Bacon, then that's the question that should be asked. Exactly. Which is why I'm asking it. <laughs> yeah, we, we definitely have to look at that. I don't know, Ms. Felton, if you happen to know that off the top of your head, but um, yeah, I mean, obviously with some of our buildings, they do have a built-in capacity to build upwards. Some of our buildings have been um, constructed specifically with that intent. Um, I can't speak to uh, exactly how that layout works or what land we might have available, but that's something we could certainly research and answer. Yes, this is this is Laura Felton. Um, I am not aware of any buildings there that were built to have a second story added to them. I do believe we have done some construction on that campus and replaced portables with actual buildings, but I will confirm that. I, I can't confirm um, either way whether there is space for additional building capacities on there or if anything is currently constructed to add a second story. But I can get back with you on that. This is uh, Mrs. Matura. Uh, you can't usually see me. Um, but looking at what fiscal responsibility that might be to take a campus that to instead of moving the kids to actually build on when there's capacity nearby, um, wondering what the what what sort of fiscal responsibility that really would be. An observation or a question? Just an observation, sorry, because no, I mean, okay. it would be expensive to do that when there is capacity right, you know, a couple of miles away. So just just my comment. Um, this is Mrs. Felton. Let me let me just add that um, I do know one of the things that the Auditor General looks at and that they report to the state legislature is excess capacity. Um, and Mountain Trail has already um, been reported as having excess capacity, and um, this this would only make excesser capacity <laughs> even more capacity at that school. So that's just to give you a piece of information that is reported um, to the Auditor General's office. Um, there has been conversation through various uh, legislative um, groups through the years that districts be. Um, be required to rent out or sell excess capacity to charter schools. And I think those of you who have been involved in through the legislative process, that's kind of been a, um, a proposition that's been mentioned um, that excess capacity does have to be reported to the school facilities board um, with the idea that um, it might be open and available to either privates or charter schools. So just to give you um, some information on where that kind of data is reported to currently. I, I think the other thing, Mrs. Felton, about that is it we're dinged for it. It's not just that we have excess capacity, it's that our audit makes it look like we're wasting money on facilities. So it's it's not just about the fact that we have the excess capacity, it's about uh, people looking at what we have and then saying, you're not doing a good enough job. 
So when that auditor general report comes out every year, you kind of are shaking your head. How do we balance this um, with the needs of the community and the desires of the community against some of the very difficult measurements that the state asks us to look at? You're correct, Mrs. Bacon. It is reported on the Auditor General's um, yearly report also. And it's a favorite for reporters and legislators. I have a comment. Um, this is Nancy Case. Um, so as parents look at schools, some parents would find uh, uh, reasons to attend a school that was smaller. That might be something they're looking for. And um, uh, some of the new program going in there, the uh, gifted contained pro program there. Um, I just think that we don't know what parents are going to choose. And we can talk about charts and graphs. But in a year or two, things can change as reputations grow, as word of mouth goes we don't know what they're going to choose and i've been in very large i've been in an elementary school that was 980 and they had to use every inch and eventually some of those were uh paired off into new schools or other schools or whatever it was and it just was a sigh of relief when the school size went down because even though you could put that many students in a school it didn't feel as good as when it became smaller. So a lot of these things, I believe, will be worked out just as parents understand. If I go to this school, there will be this many students in a class. And if I go on campus and if I go to this school, it will change. So I think parents, as they learn programs that are available for the gifted or whatever other wonderful programs Mountain Trail will have, a lot of this would just be sorted out just by parents choosing something different. So I just wanted to point that out. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Case. Mrs. Greenberg. Yes. Nancy Mrs. Sees them turn again. Um, I just wanted to piggyback on what Nancy was saying that I think it's wonderful that we've brought the self-contained gifted program to Mountain Trail Middle School, um, the Journeys program. And I think that shows that our district right now we're really focusing on bringing new programs there and i think that was kind of may have been lagging um it, at that school and i think we've shown a real commitment lately to bring um, new exciting programs to that school um, especially with the um the new principal who's in place there i think that's really exciting and um and so i think that i think that it shows the direction that our district is um, going looking at Mountain Trail Middle School right now. Mrs. Skidmore? Yes, Dr. Skidmore. This is Sue Skidmore. I understand that uh, at Mountain Trail, they're talking about some kind, all of these new fancy STEM programs, including biomedicine, et cetera. And I, I don't know whether, um, Patrick Clancy happens to be online, but if he is, I think maybe he might just enlighten us about some of the new exciting adventures he's bringing to Mountain Trail Middle School. And uh, I'll just mention, I know Mr. Clancy was actually Dr. Clancy, excuse me, um, was on our uh, meeting Tuesday. I don't think he was actually available for our meeting tonight. Um, but you are uh, very right, Dr. Skidmore. I know in addition to the Journeys program uh, being added there, um, they're looking at a number of new STEM programs being added for the upcoming uh, school year um, in the line of what you were just talking about. Thank you, Dr. Welch. Does anybody else have... Um, Mrs. Bacon. The only other thing I wanted to say was um, I worry that if we um, completely zone elementary 33 for Explorer, we're going to be back here in a year or two 
um, with a really full school that we don't, that parents aren't going to be happy with because every inch of it, like um, Mrs. K said in the elementary school her children went to, every inch of the school was going to be full. So I just wanted to kind of put that out there. This is an incredibly difficult decision. Um, and that's certainly one of the things that keeps, I keep thinking about is what are the consequences in the years to come of a decision that we make today? Or, well, we're not making a decision today, but as we decide, um, what's that gonna look like? Yeah, Susan, I see you. I'm gonna um, jump in very quickly too, um, since I haven't had a chance to say anything. Um, that's actually something I've been thinking about a lot and I sort of alluded to it days ago and I, I agree with Mrs. Bacon. I really do believe that if we make a decision, whether it comes next week or we just continue to discuss this, um, that tends to concentrate enrollment in Explorer, that this is something we're gonna be looking at. I give it more than a year, but I would say easily within two or three years, we will be having these discussions again. But the one other thing I wanted to point out, and um, I, you know, this may be when Dr. Welsh gets into the, some of the comments that we've received since um, Tuesday, is one of the words that we keep hearing, not keep, but that some folks have said is please make you know a decision permanent. We need permanence or permanent boundaries. And I, I think it's important that everyone knows that really there is no permanent boundary that um, as, as we open new schools or we close schools or repurpose them, if we wanna use that word, um, as enrollment changes, as things change, boundaries change. And you know, just very quickly, the, the home that I live in um, has gone through three different elementary school boundaries, even though of course the house has not moved. And you know, and that that is that's been due to enrollment changes over time, and um, it's just something that I think we all have to keep in the back of our minds. That as much as we would like to say, even if we make a decision tonight, and or excuse me, we vote on a decision next week, and we say yes, we we will boundary elementary thirty three to explore. There is that is not a permanent decision and um everything outside of you know probably living across the street from a school or within half a mile of a school the chances that a boundary could change are are always there. so i just wanted to kind of throw that out um and mrs matura i will throw it over to you Sure, thank you. Um, I'm going back to the, if you fit as many people as you can into a building, um, some other things get lost as well, um, is that some opportunities come with having a larger campus, like you have more options for, um, of what's being offered for classes. However, and the other flip side of that is there are a lot more students who are vying for those same classes. So the most popular classes that um, are out there, not everyone gets to go in those classes because it's such a big enrollment that there's not a chance for everyone. And when there are um, extracurricular events like uh, trips to Washington, D.C., things like that, when you have such a large population, it's by lottery and very few percentage of the kids get to go on those sorts of opportunities as schools grow. Um, and so the, the idea of, you know, not trying to push as many people in one space as possible. There's the, those outside factors as well that are um, that are seen with when schools get to be too big, that some of the opportunities that you thought came along with the big school actually get lost. Uh, Mrs. Greenberg. Dr. Skidmore. I went to an extremely large high school that was uber overcrowded. And I was in the 10th grade and my schedule began at 11 o'clock in the morning and I got out at 4.30 in the afternoon. 
This is simply limited by our lack of creativity. I certainly believe that in due time, this, this pro, you know, we could send seventh grade at 8 a.m. and we could send eighth grade at 11 o'clock. This just lacks thinking and creativity. If these folk bought these homes in good faith, and I, you know, I still can't figure out why the developer said one thing and we were saying oh, the other thing, but that, that doesn't matter now. These folk bought their homes in good faith, then I still believe we should honor that. Thank you, Dr. Skidmore. Can I ask Dr. Skidmore a question? Ask me anything you want. It doesn't mean I'm going to answer it. <laughs> okay. Well, I think you'll answer this. Um, so, when you say that, do you mean the people who are currently there or forevermore? No, I'm just saying who's ever there. You know, we're I'm talking about 200 kids right now. You know, right. You guys, listen, uh, Mrs. Bacon, in all due respect, I will not be seeing you again after December the 31st. And well, that's rude. <laughs> yeah, no, you'll be, you'll be really glad too. I know that. Okay. So, I mean, uh, there'll probably be a big, huge celebration when my uh, back end goes out the front door. So, but other, what I am saying is right now we are in a situation. No. We are in a situation with Sky Crossing. We are in a situation with the pandemic. We are in a situation with this, 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 and this for the moment. And Mrs. Greenberg is absolutely correct. Over time, we may have to make an adjustment. You may have to make an adjustment. But over time, we may have to do that. But at this current point in time, we are arguing about the dif the difference between 40 some kids according to mr bramer's, bramer's numbers and i i just really think that that those parents in sky crossing deserve an answer and they need to know that in due time it may change that's it i i don't but i have to tell you as a 10th grade student, I absolutely loved going to school, starting school at 11 o'clock instead of 7.30. Thank you, Dr. Skidmore. Um, Mrs. Bacon, did, did that answer your question? Kind of, sorta, it's, yeah, I, I know what she means. Thank you. Have a, have a question. Um, I, I think we need to honor the people wherever the information come, came from the builder information that was confusing from the district, whatever the reasoning was. Um, I think we need to honor the people who have gone, who purchased their homes, honor the, those, those people use the terminology that you say is correct. And, and let that stand for however many years we decide. And then we don't know where the homes are gonna be built. We don't know the shifts in population. It's gonna change and our crystal ball gets fuzzy at times. And so I think we need to honor it and then move forward, let those people know that you know, they have a fifth grader, they can attend the school as they thought they purchased the home for and move on. Thank you. And I don't know, I'm not seeing anybody else, but Susan, you're off my screen again. I don't think any, I, I don't get the impression that anybody's disagreeing um, with the thought process of um, either boundary to explore or allowing for what is it open enrollment variance um, to explore i think um though where julie was going and i and i think it's something that either we need to discuss now or we discuss another time is for how long um 
because I think if we set a boundary for Explorer, we will be looking at that again shortly. Whether shortly is a year or two or three, I think we'll be back having this discussion again. Um, and then if we do that, are we saying to the families in Sky Crossing, well, you've, we know you've got a year or two or three, but then after that, things may shift again and maybe we still look at an open enrollment variance. Maybe we don't, maybe then it becomes a, if you're in fifth and sixth grade, then you get to go to Explorer. But if you're fourth, you know, I mean, there are all these variations on a theme that we can talk about um, in terms of what an open enrollment variance might look like now, what it might look like then, what a boundary looks like now, what it might look like then. And I, and I think, those are all of the, the concerns and questions that the sky crossing community has raised and I'm glad they've raised them. I don't, you know, I, I appreciate, it. I sat down, read all the comments again, everything we've received. I know Dr. Welsh has a synopsis of that. And so maybe I know Julie's got her mic off, so I'm going to flip it over, but maybe then, you know, Dr. Welsh can, can bring us up to speed on that a little bit, but I do think those are the, the, the the bigger picture questions we are looking at. So. And I, I do have, the one thing, I don't wanna put this community through this again in three years. Right. Or, or four years. I mean, we're, it's emotional enough. It's very difficult for those parents. So to, to just say right now, I mean, we gotta take the long view. We have to take the long view on this. It, that's the only fair thing to do for these communities. The only other thing that I have been thinking about is what if we close Explorer to open enrollment completely and it's just Greyhawk, Pinnacle Peak, and then that the Sky Crossing and all the other schools that feed. You know, what does that look like if we just say no open enrollment from any other district, from any other place in our district, from no no one outside our district? That's another number that I'd like to see to see what that would look like going forward. Screamer? Yes, Dr. Skidmore. I understand that not all of the lots have been sold in Sky Crossing either. And if you purchase your lot after September 2020, September 15th, 2020, or September 30th, 2020, and you may be zoned someplace else. I I don't there is not a magic answer here. Some I I don't know why this confusion occurred in the first place. I'm not looking to point fingers or anything like that. I you know I I I don't know. But it is there are ways to mitigate this problem. And I again and I'm sorry, I have said this for 20 years. We are only limited by our lack of creativity. And, and Dr. Skimmer, I don't disagree. I and mean, I think there's many, many ways to mitigate. I think, you know, what we have seen via PV Connect and, and PV Online and the ability to offer curriculum virtually um, I think is something else we need to be keeping in mind going forward, period. And I've said that in the past. I mean, we've, we've had concerns about, oh, we only get Calc 2 here, or we only get, you know, can we get a Calc 3 class going? Well, yeah, via PV Online, we can get a Calc 3 class. Or, you know, if we, if we maintain a PV Connect model, and obviously I'm not talking elementary with Calc 3. But, you know, yeah, I absolutely agree. There's so many ways to be creative about this. Um, I, you know, one of the concerns, this is, you know, just that was expressed, and then Dr. Welsh, I will throw it over to you, I promise, um, was, for example, keeping the community together. So we discussed the possibility of, um, Yes, if you have purchased your home now, and then maybe we do a cutoff at X date, whether it's in a month or a year or whatever. Um, and those families will be boundary to explore. And then after that, everybody's boundary to mountain trail. 
the the comments came back that 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 separates the community that you could have you know one child in house a going to explore and the child right next door going to mountain trail based on those boundaries uh so i i do think you know obviously we have when you look at the overall picture and you look at boundaries we have um, elementary schools that are divided. Um, you look at Whispering Wind and Indian Bend, they no longer go to a solo middle school. Um, those, those were changes wrought more recently, but at least those are a little bit more natural dividing. This, this possibility might literally be house to house to house. And so, you know, again, those are all things we need to look at. Does anybody else have anything else or maybe have Dr. Welsh? Mrs. Greenberg, one, this is Susan Matura. Yes, Just to please. piggyback on that, I apologize. And then Dr. Welsh, I really apologize. Um, but when you talk about how it, you know, single house by single house, it changes. If you look at it as though if the entire, if the entire boundary of elementary school 33 is boundaried for Mountain Trail Middle School, then those houses that are available for the open enrollment variance, they are choosing to exercise that open enrollment variance and choose to go to a different school, yet the entire neighborhood is still boundaried to one place. So, and that happens right now where people choose, that, that's what open enrollment does throughout the whole, our whole district and our whole state is that neighbor by neighbor by neighbor, people make different decisions because they find different programs that um, that they think are, you know, great for their student. They want their student in Crest, and yet their next door neighbor is at Pinnacle, and the one down the street wants to go to Horizon. Um, that everyone's already making those choices, and that would be a choice that that house chose to elect to use that open enrollment variance. Um, but the entire neighborhood would still have one singular boundary. So I think that's a different way to look at it. Um, I agree, and, and sorry, Dr. Welsh, <laughs> I'll throw, get it to you very soon. I agree, but that means the open enrollment variance never ends. As opposed to it would end at some point because then there are transportation issues that, but. But open enrollment isn't transported. Right, but that's what I mean. At some point when it ends, there are, okay, maybe not the transportation issue so much, but there could be because when you lose the variance, it could be families no longer choose to open enroll and that would impact or could impact transportation. We might have to add a bus. We might have to, et cetera, et cetera. There is, it's, it, and again, the transportation is probably less of a concern, but the balance, I think. But I, but I, I, I agree. I, I agree, except if the thought process was the open enrollment variance would at some point end, it does change the conversation a little bit. At least that's my thought process. I don't know. Um, Dr. Walsh, I'll throw it over to you and maybe I'm, maybe I'm uh, mixed up on that one. That's all right. Uh, yeah, so uh, what I want to do here is uh, very similar to um, our last meeting. Uh, just run through uh, a brief synopsis of some of the comments that we received. And I know um, Ms. Felton has the ball. She'll get up uh, the names of those individuals who submitted uh, feedback both prior to our meeting last Tuesday as well as uh, prior to the meeting today, this is as of noon today, because um, we wanted to make sure, of course, that we gave everybody time to be able to review those comments that have come in. So as of uh, noon today, we had received a total of 347 comments, uh, with 146 of those being new comments since the prior meeting. Of those new comments, 71 were submissions from individuals who had responded previously and wanted to update their comments. Um, so overall, uh, based on the total span of comments from uh, both meetings all put together. Uh, we have 11 individuals who support the proposed boundary recommendations, 17 that were neutral, and 248 that were against the proposed boundary recommendations. 
Uh, again, very similar to, I think, what we've been discussing both uh, previously last Tuesday evening as well as tonight. Uh, 141 of those individuals requested that Sky Crossing feed into Middle uh, Explorer Middle School. And as we've uh, indicated, many wished for that to happen without an open enrollment variance in place. There were uh, 85 individuals, including 15 new commenters, that asked for students to attend both Explorer and Pinnacle High School. So again, just to clarify, no changes being recommended for high schools. There were 17 that requested that if students cannot attend Explorer, then Sky Crossing would, should be a K-8 school and feed into Pinnacle. And similarly, there were 11 who requested that if students cannot attend Explorer Middle School, then Sky Crossing should be K-8. And then we had some uh, smaller numbers of individuals responding on some other topics. We had three that requested that students at Wildfire receive an open enrollment variance so they could remain there and then attend Explorer and Pinnacle. We had uh, two that requested that Sky Crossing be a K-8 school and then feed into Pinnacle. Three that asked for Sky Crossing just to be a K-8 school. And on the opposite side, we had two that uh, requested that Sky Crossing be a K-6 school and then feed into Explorer. Again, some of the common themes and questions that were in the comments, again, some of these from last time, a combination of last time and this time, uh, I would just echo that many felt appreciation for the recognition of the comments that were submitted earlier. And a number of individuals still felt that an open enrollment variance uh, would split the neighborhood and raise concerns uh, about some of the property values. Uh, while no new changes to the boundaries of Pinnacle are being recommended, we did still have 16 comments that included that concern. So once again, no recommendations are being made uh, to change any of the current high school boundaries. And again, just reiterating that outside of the three comments we received, the support for a potential K-8 option was limited to those who were seeking that option only if Explorer was not the zone school. There were a couple of questions that came in that I think uh, it's worth addressing just to make sure that there's clarity for everyone. Uh, one question was uh, asking about the proposed boundaries and whether Stone Butte neighborhood is zoned for Boulder Creek or Elementary 33. Um, that neighborhood, uh, as Ms. Felton showed on the maps, and again, remember, these are all available on our website at pvschools.net slash ES33. Uh, Stone Butte is a zone for Boulder Creek under the recommended, uh, the proposed boundaries. Uh, another question that came in was, could there be a high school boundary change under these recommendations for the Boulder Creek community? Again, no, there, we're not having any recommended changes to high school boundaries um, within the recommendations we're talking about here tonight. Um, we also had questions about transportation and open enrollment. So if students open enroll at a school, do they receive transportation? Um, Generally, no. So um, the way the open enrollment process works uh, generally is that, you know, parents have the option to enroll their uh, children or child at a school, um, but they are responsible for attendance uh, to that school. Uh, some of the other questions, uh, we had a question come in asking, uh, why isn't there another middle school east of Scottsdale Road that is being considered for Greyhawk and Pinnacle Peak Prep? Um, I would just like to clarify for those who may not be as familiar with the area. Um, it's a little bit confusing because I know most people probably thinking of perhaps other places uh, and other locations across the country. Uh, we do have some components of the city of Scottsdale that are within our district boundaries, um, but those schools that are part of the Scottsdale School District um, are obviously not part of our district. We don't actually have any schools that are uh, in that area that are east of Greyhawk. Um, that are middle school specific. We do have, of course, Pinnacle Peak Prep, which is a K-8 school. Um, so there's, there is an option there, but it is not a, a zone middle school in the traditional sense. And uh, the last question that we had that I think uh, would be worth sharing with everybody, uh, someone had asked why the recommendations for the proposed uh, attendance boundaries include Pinnacle Peak and Greyhawk going to Explorer. And I believe, and Ms. Felton could probably clarify, I know I was in uh, at least a few of those boundary meetings with the committee, um, but I believe primarily that was really just due to ge geography and numbers, just trying to find the best uh, best closest school for those. And again, noting that with the horseshoe that we've alluded to a few times, those curricular decisions for which that was created are really no longer in place. So that's just a, a quick flyover of some of the feedback that we've received, again, both in the aggregate and subsequent from our um, after our meeting Tuesday.
Thank you, Dr. Welsh. Um, so does anybody else have any other comments, questions? Dr. Skidmore. Um, I understand um, that supposedly uh, next Thursday night, there will be a proposal to vote on this, the board to take a vote on this proposed boundary change. And I want to know when the community will see the proposed change. When will that be made public? Will it be Monday, August 31st, or when, when will it be made public? Sure, Ms. Chisman, I, I, I'm sure you're probably on. Would you perhaps uh, share when we typically, uh, what our time frame is for public posting of meeting notices? The meeting notice will be posted. Um, actually, the meeting notice itself has been posted. The uh, meeting will be shared with the public at least 24 hours in advance. The agenda. Yes, but will the agenda include what the proposal is, Mrs. Chisholm? The agenda will include any backup documentation that is provided by the um, uh, facility by business operations by Ms. Felton. Thank you, Ms. Chisholm. Thank you, Dr. Skidmore. Does Mrs. Bacon, I see your mic is. It's, off. It, yeah, I have it off, but I'm contemplating. I guess I wonder if we need to. I don't know if we need to look at this a little bit deeper, but maybe we don't. Maybe I'm just putting off a difficult decision. Um, that's it. Mrs. Greenberg, it's mm. Susan Matura. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, I did want to um, point out and give thanks to our committee that we asked to meet and actually delve into all of this data and go through this ad nauseum and look at it from every direction. And they were, um, they even listed as one of the cons, but something that they had looked at and still made the recommendation based on knowing that the builder may have put out information or that information may have been given to the um, sky crossing community alluding to explorer um, and that was something that the boundary committee met and discussed and still came up with the proposal as they did and so i don't want to i, I just want to make sure we point out that the that committee did all the due diligence and all the work and even knowing that information um, and came up with these recommendations. And so that they have put all of that work into it for you know a few months of meeting and, and discussing before the proposals were made to us. So just something to keep in mind. Thank you, Ms. Matura. Um, I guess the question I have for Dr. Welsh um, and or Mrs. Felton is um, if we are presented uh, with a recommendation perhaps to look at the numbers again, you know, reconvene the committee or reconvene the committee uh, with perhaps more representation from other, you know, some communities. Uh, when do we really need to have a decision made, I guess would be the question. Ms. Felton, you want to handle that one or you want me to jump in on that one? So, you know, it's more of when you want to prepare that community for where they're going to go and who all it involves, particularly when we start bringing the community in to make decisions about the name of the school, the mascot, the colors, participate in um, curricular or um, other things related to the school. As far as I'm concerned, I just need to know, I don't know, a couple months ahead of time to set up transportation routes. Um, so again, I'm kind of the, the, the least of the concern. Um, so I kind of turn that over to Dr. Welsh to see if he has anything else he would like to add to that. No, absolutely. Thank you, Ms. Felton. Yeah, I think the other piece is, yeah, 
there's two components to these boundary recommendations. We have a recommendation for elementary boundaries, uh, and we have a recommendation for middle school boundaries. Um, you know, one option that we could look at, of course, um, is adopting elementary boundaries and elementary configuration. Um, as you may recall from our earlier meetings, gosh, it seems like forever ago because it was pre-COVID. Um, but uh, for us to be able to maintain the timeline in terms of some of the instructional decisions that we need to make, um, we really do need those decisions to be made pretty quickly on the elementary component. Uh, we are looking at beginning the process of identifying a principal for the, for the new school. That principal then can begin um, to work with their teacher cadre, um, begin to work with the community and develop um, that uh, school council so that we can start making decisions and come up with a probably new name for, for the school other than elementary 33 and for us to stay on target with that time frame, we really do need that to happen um, within the month of, of September. Um, with respect to the middle school piece, we already do have, uh, you know, obviously existing boundaries in place. Uh, we do have temporary uh, boundary uh, information that we have. If it was something where we wanted to specifically just look at the middle school boundaries, um, that's something we could certainly do. And you know, probably take a couple of months to be able to focus on and then be able to come back with with uh, an additional recommendation there. I think one of the um, caveats to that I would just point point out is that, um, you know, I would want to make sure that we are really engaging with um, those in the community that perhaps kind of tuned out a little bit to the process when they saw the initial recommendations, because I imagine that uh, families in um, many areas that were in the potentially impacted uh, zones that we were looking at probably saw it and said, okay, you know, doesn't impact me moving forward. If we do look at things that might impact other people, I think we really have to make sure that we're getting those folks involved. Uh, we are investigating um, whether we would have to follow a similar process in terms of notification. Uh, you know, there is there are requirements uh, in law in terms of us making sure that we are notifying all households um, by U.S. mail. Uh, of any potential changes, uh, we'll investigate and make sure we have a firm answer to that. But just as a, as an estimate, you know that those mailers were, uh, I, I think, if I remember right, Miss Felton, about ten thousand dollars to send out. So that could be uh, a cost to that as well. Just just to put that out there, just so that we know um, what that potential impact could be. Thank you, Dr. Welsh. So, does anybody else have any comments or questions? Or I have a comment. This is Nancy Case. Yep. Um, I feel since we've had such a large response from the community there, well orchestrated, and they spoke to us before we closed down our in person meetings. Um, I feel we owe it to them to make a decision sooner rather than later. Um, and I think to settle their lives, their planning. I've been a mother for many years and parents plan out their futures. And I think we owe it to them to make the, this decision as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Case. Does anybody else have any other comments, questions? Mrs. Mrs. Matura. Thank you, Mrs. Matura. Um, so question being, if, if we decided we wanted to put off the middle school boundary, it would mean reconvening a boundary committee and then re-noticing everyone and holding another two community meetings. Um, that would be the process moving forward. Um, and so if we decide to do that or not decide to do that, I feel like that needs to be decided kind of quickly before we decide what's going to be on the agenda come next week. So, and I feel like here's the, you know, the chance to do that. So what is, what is, what are we thinking? Well, I, Mrs. Matura, I really think that's Dr. Welsh's decision. Okay. <laughs> he wants to proceed with that. And okay. um, he's gonna, ha taking all of this into consideration, unfortunately, um, that I feel like he needs to come to the board with a recommendation based on all of this. So, you know, we may, I mean, maybe you know what you want to do right now, Dr. Welsh, but I would guess you want to go back and talk with your cabinet and talk with 
other mm -hmm. leaders to see what the thoughts are before you make a recommendation on what we're going to vote on next week. Yeah, I, I think to that point exactly. Yeah, I mean, we're going to take the feedback that we receive. I mean, we, we were literally obviously going through all of the comments that came in today. Today, um, So we're in, in the process of uh, processing those at this point. So yeah, I'll work with uh, President Greenberg in terms of uh, our agenda for next week and what a potential action item may look like, as well as obviously in consul consultation with cabinet and, and other individuals. Okay, so d then to Dr. Skidmore's point, then at what point in time do people know what we intend to vote on next week? When will that be? When will that be known? So I think um, going back to uh, what Ms. Chisman shared, typically our agendas, we have a meeting notice posted. So, I mean, everybody knows there's a meeting and that is something that we're going to, um, you know, be discussing. Um, with the specifics of the agenda, we typically post at, at least 24 hours in advance. Obviously, if we can get that out earlier, I think given the circumstances here, we would make every effort to do so. So that way people had that information and then um, would be able to know what the proposal might be. Thank you. And I, you know, and I just want to remind everybody that um, whatever we get, if if a recommendation comes in, we as the board obviously can accept that recommendation and we can amend that recommendation or we can reject that recommendation. I mean, that's that's what the vote is all about. So, um, you know, just just we all need to keep that in mind. Um, and I'm not suggesting we will do, you know, I, I suspect we'll do one of those things, but, you know, they're all out there on the table. Um, does anybody else have anything else that they would like to discuss during this study session? I'm not seeing anything because Mrs. Matura is on my screen, so I and I don't hear anything else. So it looks like we are ready to adjourn. I want to thank everybody who joined us today. Um, I really do want to thank members of the community who are very passionate about this and for the comments that we've received in total, but certainly also for those we've received since. Um, as I said, I, I believe we've all read them and um, you know, thrilled that we are getting that up to the minute feedback. Uh, very much appreciated. And um, this will be appearing on our agenda. The meeting is next Thursday, September 3rd at 7 p.m. And if there is no further discussion, Dr. Skidmore, may I have a motion to adjourn? So move. Mrs. Chisman, you want to do it as roll call? Absolutely. Dr. Skidmore? Aye. Mrs. Matura? Aye. Mrs. Greenberg? Aye. Mrs. Case? Aye. Mrs. Bacon? Aye. So at 7.54 on um, Thursday, August, what day is it? 27. <laughs> Sorry. We are adjourned and I hope you will all join us next week for our regular board meeting. Thank you all. Thank you. Have a good night.